This is the CBS Evening News. Bob Schieffer reporting. Good evening. U.S. air travel was badly disrupted today as ground workers struck eastern airlines and pilots honored the picket lines. Management's plan to keep the airline running fell through. Eastern conceded only 50 of more than 1,000 Saturday flights got off the ground. That left travelers scrambling for seats on other carriers. And the worst is yet to come. The strike could spread to the railroads. Peter Van Sant begins our coverage. Empty concourses, empty gates, idle planes. We're going to shut them down. Striking machinists and pilots have crippled Eastern Airlines, forcing the cancellation of more than 1,000 flights, leaving tens of thousands of passengers desperately trying to find a seat on other airlines. It's depressing. I just keep telling you to stand by, stand by. You don't know whether you're going or not. Just cut my vacation short, so I'm not very happy at all. The impact of the walkout of machinists and pilots has been devastating. Here in Atlanta, where on a normal Saturday, more than 260 flights depart, just five have taken off today. The whole system's shut down. It's not just the Atlanta hub. Everything's shut down. Eastern had boasted as late as yesterday that it would serve all of its 64 domestic cities. But by tonight, just a handful of cities received a few flights. The problem, a shortage of pilots. We're prepared to stay out just as long as the machinists. We're prepared to stay out until the problem is solved. Late this afternoon in Miami, Eastern officials said that pilot solidarity is already weakening, allowing the airline to schedule more flights. Hopefully this is going to continue through the night into tomorrow, and we can uh, mount more of an operation tomorrow and then keep spooling it up day by day. Talks between the two sides bitterly broke off at midnight. So this is the most uh, devious and lying management I've ever seen when it comes to what has been contained in that contract proposal. No new negotiations are scheduled between management and machinists until Thursday. In the meantime, the government says it will make sure Eastern planes are safe. Any flight of the Easterns that go up uh, will be by, with qualified pilots, uh, licensed mechanics will be servicing it, and the FAA will be inspecting it. Eastern says it has large cash reserves and will not file for bankruptcy. The airline says it's willing to continue operating indefinitely during the strike. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. Caught in the middle of the war between union and management are the tens of thousands of people scheduled to fly Eastern. They're the first casualties of this strike, and Victoria Cordery has their story. In Miami, passengers returning from a leisurely Caribbean cruise got a serious dose of civilization. Eastern is on strike, and they are stranded. We don't have money or plastic. You're in serious trouble. It's a long walk to Baltimore. That's all I know. Eastern is a vital link in most cruise industry packages delivering and picking up passengers to and from the ports. Eastern sent an employee to tag the luggage of the arriving tourists, but there's no guarantee that they're going anywhere. We're dealing with the situation virtually on a uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis based upon availability. I paid you. You refuse to take me. I want my money back. At Miami International Airport, ticket agents scrambled to calm customers and shuffle them to other airlines. But there are reports some carriers were turning away Eastern passengers refusing to honor their tickets. It's been bad, hasn't it? It's getting worse as the day goes on. People have been waiting hours at Eastern's ticket counter. I got at least another hour to get to the counter, and I'll probably be here until Tuesday or Wednesday. Wait, look. All along the East Coast, the airports may have been different, but the passenger sentiment toward Eastern seemed the same. Eastern's management should be totally ashamed of themselves. If today was chaotic at some East Coast airports, it may have been only a signal of troubles to come. By Monday, the union is threatening to close down major commuter and inner city rail service, further testing the tolerance of the nation's travelers. Victoria Cordieri, CBS News, New York. Mother Nature had a hand in flight cancellations and delays today at the Fort Worth Dallas airport. Planes had to be de-iced after a sleet storm and cold wave. Frozen roadways wreaked havoc with freeway traffic. The temperature in one Texas city fell 30 degrees in one hour. Still ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, Secretary of State Baker heads to Vienna for east-west arms talks. And later in the broadcast, the ice ladies come. Before I started wearing no-nonsense, I used to...
Vice President Quayle acknowledged today that John Tower's nomination as Secretary of Defense is in trouble, but said the administration would fight on with no idea of giving up. Quayle's comments came during a New Hampshire ski weekend that also included a race with White House Chief of Staff John Sununu. So here they are, ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President of the United States racing against from the looks of it, Staff Chief Sununu, he's the one without the hat, uh, won the race, but between runs, it was Quayle who did most of the talking, saying it's Senate Armed Services Chairman Sam Nunn who's responsible for Towers' problems. This nomination hinges uh, really uh, on one individual in the Senate, and that is the Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, once he decided to go uh, against the President, uh, we knew that it was going to be difficult. Uh, John Sununu president everyone else did everything they possibly could to convince Sam Nunn to support this nomination. But once Sam Nunn decided to go against the nomination, we knew there would be an uphill battle. Nunn declined comment, but Tower will make his case on television tomorrow when he appears on the CBS News broadcast of Face the Nation. Secretary of State Baker headed off to Vienna tonight, and that is the subject of our Washington Notebook segment, because on Monday, Baker will take part in reopening negotiations between the NATO countries and the Warsaw Pact nations, talks aimed at reducing the non-nuclear forces in Europe. As we learned this week, after years of dawdling, the timing now seems right for progress. Potentially, these are the most important negotiations that we've engaged in with the Soviet Union. What's at stake is the future of the European military confrontation and by extension the future of american defense spending future structure of the nato alliance and in some respects the whole future of the political complexion in europe and between east and west in europe a lot is at stake next week when the united states the soviet union and their allies sit down to talk about reducing the huge arsenal of soldiers and non-nuclear weapons in europe an arsenal which costs the west nearly 300 billion dollars a year for 15 years now, both sides have been talking, but they haven't agreed on much of anything, not even on how many soldiers and tanks are in Europe. Each side has claimed the other's forces were superior, but there's hope on both sides that this time it will be different. The administration now has a wide open chance to propose something more far reaching to the NATO allies. The wide open chance came in December when Soviet leader Gorbachev stunned Western leaders by offering to cut Soviet forces in Europe by 500,000 troops, six tank divisions, over the next two years. It's as though he were, to coin a phrase, reading our lips about what it was uh, in Eastern force organization that most concerned NATO. Some see this as George Bush's first chance to show where he wants to go on arms control issues. It's an opportunity for George Bush uh, to test Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, it's an opportunity for Bush to test Gorbachev's intentions. Even so, most experts say don't expect too much. The Reagan administration motto was a bold proposal. The Bush administration model, motto has been prudent proposals. Yet all agree the timing for an arms control breakthrough could not be better. Why? Because both the superpowers have pressing economic problems that make military cuts a very attractive proposition. And it's certainly a chance for somebody to make history here. Uh, and uh, if I were George Bush, I'd be thinking very hard about what creative steps can be taken to keep the ball rolling and try to get out of this level of military competition in Europe. The NATO starting point is to bring the Warsaw Pact's two-to-one advantages in tanks and artillery down to NATO levels, and after that, reduce the forces on both sides, 5 to 10 percent. The magic's gone. The minute the lights go out, you fall asleep. It's time to change your bulb to Philips. Philips Longer Life Square Bulbs last 33% longer than ordinary round bulbs. You're looking at a list of foods that have more fiber per serving and prunes. Prunes, the high fiber fruit. Quaker State engines don't know when to quit. My 
Sometimes pushing 250,000 miles. Quaker State exceeds every single car maker's U.S. requirements for maximum engine protection. The big Q stands for quality. Always has, always will. Our dentist gave us the word about healthier teeth and gums. Baking soda. So we tried new Arm & Hammer Dental Care. The baking soda toothpaste with fluoride. A recent survey shows two out of three dentists and hygienists recommend baking soda for healthier teeth and gums. Mmm, dental care leaves my mouth feeling fresh and clean. Tastes minty. Try new Arm & Hammer Dental Care, the baking soda toothpaste, or concentrated powder for healthier teeth and gums. Huge media merger was announced today. Time Incorporated and Warner Communications are joining forces through a stock swap. The deal is valued at $18 billion. For a lot of American communities, garbage is a big deal. The problem, too much trash, not enough money to get rid of it. Bruce Morton in Washington has a report. Garbage, trash. Even in rural Harford County, Maryland, they generate a lot of it, and it's expensive three to four hundred thousand dollars an acre to put it in a landfill which meets tough new regulations from Washington. Layers of stone dust, gravel, plastic liner, and dirt all have to be put down before garbage can be dumped here. Some say if the federal government sets the standards, it should help pay the bills. We feel if these are going to be mandated, there could at least be some help coming down from the federal government. Now, what help, if any, is coming down? Very damn little. It's going to cost a lot of money, and you're going to be left holding the bag. The National Association of Counties is meeting here this weekend, and some officials, especially from rural counties, worry about the cost of the new regulations. Others disagree. Regardless of whether the, the money comes from the federal, state, or local government, it comes ultimately from the taxpayer. Citizens' willingness to pay is surprising. They'll pay if they know what it's for. If I, if I know it's to make my landfill better, I'll pay it. And the costs may make local officials look for other solutions to the problem, as old as civilization, of what to do with the garbage. There are other alternatives. There are other alternatives that are cost effective and in fact can produce a profit for a local community. Back in Harford County, they're trying. Trash goes into this privately owned incinerator. It burns almost everything. It's even slowly consuming the county's pile of a million or so old tires. The incinerator produces steam and sells the steam to a local army base for heating. The residue, that black stuff, is about 10% of the original volume of garbage, and the incinerator company pays the county to put it in, you guessed it, a landfill. The incinerator is state-of-the-art, meets federal requirements, but the county is still spending money on landfills, $10 million roughly over the last five years, costs which may go up as Harford County continues to grow. And officials there and elsewhere worry that the new landfill rules are the wave of the future, with Washington saying to local officials, we don't have any money, we just set the standards. You figure out how to enforce them. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Washington. The future of a mountain valley in Washington state is in the hands of the Supreme Court. The court will decide if the valley, its residents, and its resources can cope with a major ski resort. More on that now from law correspondent Rita Brave. The Metow Valley glimmers like a crystal set high in the Cascade Mountains of Washington. 50 miles long, a mile wide. Some ranching, a little cross-country skiing. One of the cleanest rivers in the nation. For more than 10 years, the people who live here have been fighting. Neighbor against neighbor, locked in a bitter struggle over the future of this valley. At issue the building of a downhill ski resort. This is concentrated recreation. It uses a very small amount of, of forest lands to benefit a great number of people. Devon's vision is a resort that could serve up to 8,000 skiers a day. Condominiums and hotels on privately owned land, ski lifts and runs on adjacent U.S. Forest Service property atop Sandy Butte Mountain. Without harming the environment, we can have a development that will benefit the local people and benefit uh, society at large. Under the Reagan administration, the Forest Service sided with the developers and granted a permit. But some local citizens raised questions. What would the development mean for the herd of mule deer that winters here? Or for the ranches that depend on the limited water supply in the valley? The group filed suit claiming the permit was given in violation of federal law requiring full study of the potential environmental impact of the project. 
brings into to question water. How much water is available? We've had four years of drought, and if they're talking about just flushing toilets and taking showers and hot baths and hot tubs, the, the impact on the natural resources would be very, very great. Yeah. Other longtime residents oh, insist yeah. that the environmentalists just want to keep the good life in the valley for themselves. It's not a matter of uh, now that we're here and we've got what we want, we can close the door to everybody else. Uh, it's not really a fair attitude. So far, though, the preservationists have kept the crowds out. The U.S. Supreme Court is now considering the case and will determine the fate of this valley by the time the snow melts. Rita Braver, CBS News, Winthrop, Washington. The medical environment for many pregnant women is under a threat, especially women who happen to live in rural America. The health dangers are growing for mothers and babies, babies alike. John Blackstone now with that story. Mama's uh -huh. baby, where's Mama's baby? Liz Fergan's baby is due any day now, but there is no obstetrician in the rural Arizona town where she lives. And Wickenburg is like small towns across the country. Delivering babies is becoming one of those things that's not done in towns this size anymore. Liz Fergan will have to drive more than an hour to Phoenix. Uh, anything could go wrong between here and Phoenix, and, you know, if everything goes just fine in an ideal situation, it's still going to be very, very scary to know that you may have to stop along the roadside and deliver a baby. Doctors in all specialties are moving away from rural America, but obstetricians are abandoning the countryside in record numbers. In Arizona alone, more than half the doctors who deliver babies in many rural counties have quit in the past three years. One reason? Dramatically rising costs for malpractice insurance. In order to keep up with the premiums for the insurance for malpractice, we would have had to double the number of patients that we were delivering. There are hidden costs as well. As the number of obstetricians has declined, studies show the number of low birth weight babies has increased. The infant mortality rate will, will go up and uh, the, the cost to the state and more important, the cost to the family and humanity is very high. That's why Arizona's governor has ordered the creation of an emergency transportation system to help pregnant women in isolated areas get to hospital delivery rooms. But that won't help rural women get the frequent checkups that city dwellers come to expect. I feel like because I come in so often, I know exactly what's going on with my baby. And it's been good so far. And if there's any problems, they can detect it right away. A study in Washington state shows that rural mothers who don't get this extensive prenatal care are almost twice as likely to have complications at birth. Arizona's emergency transportation system may help get more mothers into the city. But what may really be needed is a way to get more doctors into the country. John Blackstone, CBS News, San Francisco. National Hockey League today expelled Bob Probert of the Detroit Red Wings. Probert was arrested this week on a drug smuggling charge that could get him 20 years in prison. in South London today, six people were killed, 30 badly hurt. One train apparently smashed into the rear of the other. Several cars rolled down a steep embankment into residential backyards. The cause has not yet been determined. The government of South Africa faced a force today it didn't want to reckon with, the power of song. So it pulled the plug before the music could even start. Martha Teisner now with that. Today's concert, which would have been the biggest ever in South Africa, was banned. The government decided the music might have been dangerously political, a threat to security. A few scuffles after the last big concert in 1986 were cited by the government as the reason for the ban. But last year, pro-government lobbyists actually praised the concert in a propaganda film as an example of South Africa's progress toward racial equality. Here, there is a belief in change but through the medium of harmonious interaction. The government refused to comment on the ban. It is viewed here as another example of the authorities' sensitivity to music. Before a record can be played on South Africa's government radio, the lyrics must be cleared by censors. Not even record stores have complete freedom to sell what they want. The government is worried about the impact of music that South Africa's most popular musicians acknowledge does have a message. The government itself is saying it's against apartheid. The government itself is saying that it, you know, it wants to dismantle apartheid. I mean, the kinds of messages that, that musicians will be giving will be uh, 
no, not, not fundamentally different from what, what the government itself is saying. Clegg, an anthropologist turned musician, is now South Africa's hottest international performer. Known as the White Zulu, he has tried to use his talent to heal South Africa's racial divisions. Even so, some of his music has been banned. In spite of bans, the songs the government is afraid of are being heard, but in cramped clubs by small audiences. The name of this song means the struggle, performed by a group called Baete. Today, they joined the rest of the musicians scheduled to play in the band concert and held their own concert. Together, they sang the African national anthem, but nobody in South Africa heard them. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Johannesburg. In the occupied West Bank, Israeli soldiers today turned back hundreds of Israeli peace activists who wanted to meet with Palestinians, but a number of activists managed to get through anyway. One of their leaders charged Defense Minister Rabin with bowing to pressure from militant Jewish settlers. Ready to sell your house? Call Coldwell Banker. We don't just tell you we'll do everything we can to find you a buyer. We guarantee we'll use 18 proven marketing techniques to sell your home. We guarantee it in writing. And we wouldn't give you that guarantee if we weren't confident of one thing. Coldwell Banker. Expect the best. We guarantee it. A member of the Sears Financial Network. When my minor arthritis pain acts up, even little things are a big effort. But I don't take aspirin anymore. I take Advil. Advil gives me hours of relief from arthritis pain, and it's gentler to my stomach than aspirin. Advil, advanced medicine for pain. If I told you my pantyhose could go through an obstacle course like this without a snag, you'd say, no way. And I'd say, no nonsense. Pantyhose that last are no nonsense. You wouldn't believe the stuff my dad had to do to get his hands on his dream machine. Ah! You name it, he'd do it. Ah! I get queasy just thinking about it. Ah! Here's my dream machine, the new Cutlass Supreme. And all I had to do to get one was go to my old dealer. This is not your father's old mobile. Ignition. Well, in Alaska today, there was much ado about mushing. 49 sled dog teams set out on the annual Iditarod race, 1,100 miles from Anchorage to Nome. Musher to beat three-time defending champ Susan Butcher. Top prize, $50,000 in cold cash, so to speak. As part of our effort to keep you up to date on the latest trends, our next story is about the way hockey is being played at some schools these days. It's a mixture of ice hockey and very nice hockey. Jonathan Sanders reports. It's a tough game, even for those who play it professionally. The ice is hard. The skates are sharp. Pucks fly in all directions. So what a surprise to find its popularity soaring. Come on, you guys, get in front of it! Among girls. Let's go! Chalk it up to the women's movement, to demands for team sports in winter, whatever. Girls at New England private schools have found the thrill of a game called Fire on Ice addictive. It's aggressive. It's, and also it's new. Over time, practice and competition have raised skill levels. It's also taught the girls a new vocabulary. Just got a killer slap shot. <laughs> there are people on our team known to slash right back. And they know a hat trick isn't something you get at Bloomingdale's. All year I wanted a hat trick, and that's three goals. And I didn't get it, and I came close. In two games, I got two goals apiece. They play by NCAA rules, same as the boys. With one big exception, no body checking. It's supposed to be non-contact. I mean, you bump into people, and you can push them into boards, but you can't outright check someone. The girls really have to rely they on can't, their skills. They have to rely on their skills. They can't rely on, on brute strength to just push someone down. It's hockey, not fighting. Fluid skating, not body slam. Instead of swearing, civility. I've seen girls pick each other up and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and 
whereas I'm not sure that a, um, a boy would do that. Like the boys, girls now have their own championship tournament and varsity letters. And I'm going to get my new jacket, big puffer T on it. And prep school graduates have already brought girls hockey into Northeast colleges. Next goal, the Olympics. Jonathan Sanders, CBS News, Windsor, Connecticut. That's the news. Susan Spencer will be here tomorrow. Later tonight on West 57th, Oscar nominee Jody Foster. I'm Bob Schieffer, CBS News, New York. This is CBS. Just ahead on 11 News.